Okay, let's get started. Welcome back, everyone. Um, we're ready to start our last session of this week's forum. Um, I'm really excited for this one. I think there's a lot of really good presentations on. Um, this will be the Education Outreach and Community Science session. So I'm going to pass it over to your session moderator, my colleague Tara, and I will see you back when we start our panel discussions later on in, this, in the session. So I'll pass it over to you, Tara. Thank you. So uh, good afternoon. My name is Tara Shichenko. I'm the science writer and development coordinator intern at the Invasive Species Center. I'll be your moderator for session 1C, or sorry, 3C, education, outreach, and community science. Mackenzie will be moderating the panel discussion. Thank you very much for your continued participation in the 2022 Invasive Species Forum. We're excited to have speakers and attendees from around the globe and look forward to meeting again next year during the first week of February for the 2023 Forum. Uh, I'd like to note, please use the Q&A feature to post your questions, and there'll be a Q&A after each presentation, followed by two panel discussions. So first up, uh, I'd like to welcome Lee Greenwood, who will be presenting on the topic, Let's Talk About Moth Names. So Lee Greenwood is the Forest Health Program Director, North American Region at the Nature Conservancy. Lee's work focuses on bringing multiple stakeholders together to achieve common goals in forest health, including managing the Don't Move Firewood campaign, convening the continental dialogue on non-native forest insects and diseases, and working on the international biosecurity measures for solid wood packaging. Welcome, Lee. Thanks for a great intro. I will take just a second here to get my PowerPoint queued up so everyone can see it. How does that look, Tara? Good? All right, I'm gonna take that as it looks good. So- yeah, it looks great. Okay, great. So uh, my short name for this presentation was let's talk about moth names, but I thought we would start out by clearing the air. This is not just Truvelo's folly. So we're gonna talk extensively about one moth in particular, Lymantria dispar, which is an invasive moth with a very problematic common name. Um, and as Tara said, I am the Forest Health Program Director for the Nature Conservancy. And just because it's really confusing speaking of names, the Nature Conservancy is a global nonprofit dedicated to the protection of nature. And then there is also a separate organization named the Canada Nature Conservancy. That's actually a completely different entity. And I work for the global one, not the specifically Canadian one. I'm coming to you from Missoula, Montana. Uh, and just to make matters more complicated, the Nature Conservancy does have a, an excellent presence in Canada doing work under a different name, which is Nature United. So in case you were wondering, then now you have an explanation of that. I also wanna put out some special thanks to my colleague, Jonathan Walter. Um, he helped me out with providing some slides from a prior presentation he did on the same topic. So to start off, names and words and meanings, they change all the time. We are always looking into um, changes in language as the world moves forward. And recently, actually, just yesterday, a new name was announced for a sports team. Um, they are renaming tons of mountains in the United States right now. There's an entire US commission to rename army bases, and then we rename everything else too. Ducks, ski areas, fish, you name it. So, and names change for many, many reasons. So while this might feel like an isolated situation with a lot of attention um, towards this particular moth, Lymantria dispar, and it is an economically and environmentally important moth that has very high visibility. The core of this issue is not unique in the slightest. So I do not work for the Entomological Society of America. They are my colleagues, but they're, um, they're the ones that have the jurisdiction in the United States in order to change the name of an insect, uh, which will not shock you. And um, the past, at this, at the time she made the quote, she was the current president, there's now a new president, but the past president of the Entomological Society of America, Michelle Smith said um, this past summer, you know, the purpose of common names is to make communication easier between scientists and the public audiences they serve. And in that way, when we look at certain common names, we realize that they will not succeed at being easier communication between scientists and public audiences 
because like she said, the names that are unwelcoming to marginalized communities are running directly counter to that goal. And so when you identify that you have a problem, it is best to then move forward towards a potential solution. This was an identified problem by the ESA. And the identified problem, and forgive me for using a word that is indeed a widely acknowledged ethnic slur, is that a very commonly uh, identified and managed and encountered insect was called the gypsy moth. That word, gypsy, is a widely acknowledged insult to an ethnic group. It is a slur for people from a particular ethnic group called the Roma or the Romani, depending on who um, terminology. The term gypsy is widely associated with derogatory um, meanings. It is often associated with transience, uncleanliness, dishonesty. You may think in your head, oh my goodness, I never realized when I said I've been gypped, I've actually been using an ethnic slur to describe something that's terrible, but you were, and now you know better. Um, they are also associated with the occult, which is sort of, um, you know, has religious undertones as well as fortune telling and curses. And then they're just uh, associated with low socioeconomic status, which um, all of these things put together represent a pretty unpleasant set of associations with a single word. Now, there are some people in groups that do have positive associations with the word gypsy, but even those tend to be based in a misunderstanding of their culture and history, a stereotype of their people, or even an idealization or a romanticization of their history or their people, which is um, a falsehood. And so it's not a fair or appropriate association. Put together, the Entomological Society of America, along with a lot of colleagues like myself, decided that it was about time to find a new name for Lymantria Dispar. It was a very important opportunity that they decided to move forward, and it was long overdue, quite frankly. There have been objections to this, names, this name for a very long time, but they had never risen to the point of urgency and action that they did in the um, last approximately year and a half. So this is an opportunity for all of us. We can do better than this. In order to do better by many insects, the Entomological Society of America decided to create a whole process to not treat this as an isolated problem, but rather a problem that presented an opportunity for correcting more than one wrong. And so they created a robust and community-based system to address public problematic names holistically. And they already had existing rules for how one would create an insect name. And those first couple blocks on the chart here, bullet points, excuse me, are some of the pre-existing realities of how they um, the ESA actually creates names for insects when necessary. So they would like the name to be descriptive of the appearance or natural history characteristics in a commonly understood word that people can really, you know, use. Um, they are not supposed to refer to an ethnic group or a geography. They are not supposed to be named for a specific person. So for instance, um, Etienne Trouvelot, who is the person who introduced the Lymetria population into the North America would not be an appropriate choice for the name of the insect. It's not supposed to contain the Latin or Greek or scientific name, which brings me to an interesting point. Um, folks in Canada especially have been using a temporary name for this insect, Lymetria dispar, as LD moth or even LDD moth because its full Latin name in the Eastern United States for that subspecies is Lymetria dispar dispar. That was a really good temporary solution for a problem that existed because we didn't have a new name associated with the Latin name. Now, hopefully what we'll be able to do is unite under a new name so that there's no more um, multiple names in use in English. So while it was a, a good solution, it violates one of the core rules, which is containing Latin, essentially, initials. And so hopefully we'll be able to move past it over time as we implement the new name. And then there's not supposed to be cultural references and there's not supposed to be anything overtly negative in an insect name. So names that are like filthy or dirty or killer, murder or something like that, those would not be accepted as a modern insect name in this system. And then last but not least, for specifically Lymantria dispar, this name we decided would not be appropriate to use anything that was associated closely with a stereotype or a theme or a concept that has been associated with the Roma people. Basically, in consultation with both the Roma professional scholars that we um, worked with, as well as just best practices for writing a historical wrong. We wanted a very clean break from the old name, 
to a new acceptable name. And in doing that, some of the names that people thought of intuitively, unfortunately, really didn't fit. So for instance, people would suggest, oh, you know, this is an insect that travels a lot, let's say traveler moth. Well, unfortunately, that is associated with a stereotype that the Roma people do not appreciate. And therefore, it was deemed to be, even though there is a biological link, not an appropriate potential name for the insect. So here's our timeline. We're wrapping it up. So late summer, we convened a um, Eldest Bar Working Group through the Entomological Society of America. Um, about 50 people decided to self-select to join and justified their interest and were accepted, including Canadian representation for the Entomological Society of Canada, because obviously we are all on the same continent and making sure that we are all comfortable with the selected name in English is really important. And then we worked through the newly formed Better Common Names project working process and structure across the fall and winter to come up with a name. And we did a very comprehensive search. Um, I've got some stats here. So we started with over 160 names that were just suggestions. Then we found 60 plus um, names in other languages that have been used historically in the native range of the insect, which is of course um, all across Eurasia. So it's a massive number of languages and geographies. Then we did a series of group votes and then public polls and so forth to try to winnow the names down. And then when we got down to the last few names, we decided to um, basically have a discussion and put forth the name that had the most acceptable characteristics according to the opinion of all of the people in the um, working group and steering committee. And the name that was finally proposed is Spongy Moth. Now, anybody who is a French speaking Canadian is probably laughing. So they're saying, oh my gosh, you just spent like six months picking the exact same name as we use in Quebec, um, which is pretty much true. Uh, the name in Quebec, uh, France, and parts of Europe is often associated with the word spongy because of the texture of the egg masses. So it's, I can't say it because I don't speak French, but I will attempt, it is spongeuse. And that word basically means spongy. So on that note, if you happen to so be a Entomological Society of America uh, member, you are invited to comment on the selection of the name Spongy Moth. At this time, comment period ends next week. Um, you can comment for, you can comment against, you can talk about how you do or do not like the process of how it was selected. Uh, they are taking all manners of feedback. The reality of this name change is that it's much more than changing a name. You're going to have to implement the name change. That's actually going to be as difficult or probably far more difficult over time than the process of picking a new acceptable name. We're going to have to change an unbelievable number of things in the invasive species community, whether it's regulations themselves, policies, legal language, handouts, radio ads, brochures, books, stickers, websites, pesticide labels, that's gonna be a particularly difficult one. Maybe the most difficult of all will be um, public knowledge. Every single element of every single part of this change is going to be on its own timeline of acceptance, whether that's a manager who's accepting they're going to have to um, work this into their reprinting schedule for pamphlets, or whether it's a person who's going to have to decide whether or not they are going to start using the new name or not. I want to make clear that acceptance is a really important element, um, as is planning, eventual implementation, and then I accidentally included acceptance twice. So I guess it's twice as uh, important. Sorry for that typo. Um, but please do not use this as an excuse for slowness. We realize that there are processes in place that may take time, but that is not an excuse to take more time than is necessary because this is a problem that's been in existence for decades. We've decided to fix it as an entomological community and it will take everybody in order to actually make the changes. They will be gradual, they will certainly be uneven, but it will be important as a community to move forward on this in good faith. In order to help everybody move forward, we're putting in place an implementation committee. The first um, meeting of the implementation committee was a few days ago, um, and they are drafting a implementation toolkit to make life easier, setting out timelines, suggested wordings, business, newslet uh, business letters in order to explain the change, that sort of thing. So it's in your power as somebody who works in the invasive species community to frame this change as an opportunity to everybody. We have a moment here where we can do better. We can be more accurate. We can be more descriptive. We can be less insulting to a group of people. 
And we can use this as a physical characteristic of the egg case to be diagnostic in our outreach to increase the possibility of reporting this insect correctly in new infestations and outbreaks. So we can make this choice when it's necessary to find a new name, and in this case, one that really serves us for outreach, early detection, and education on this particular invasive species. So I would just like to say thank you so much to the Invasive Species uh, Center. Um, they initially reached out to a colleague to give a presentation, and I was thrilled to be nominated to provide it. You may are, you are very welcome to email me if you have more questions directly. My email is listed on this page, lgreenwood at tnc, as in the nature conservancy, org. Um, and then I'd also just like to say thank you to the Entomological Society of America for all of their support in leading this process forward as the entity with the actual jurisdiction to implement this name change. If you'd like to see the formal press release and supporting materials on their website, um, that is a fairly lengthy link at the bottom, so I don't suggest you type it in, but if you go to their press releases, you will find this page that says Spongy Moth Proposed. I will leave it uh, on this page to um, open up for questions until Tara and Mackenzie informs me that uh, we must move on to the next presenter. Thank you, Lee, for your presentation. Um, we did have a few questions in the chat. Uh, so the first question is, um, are there any plans to change common names that begin with a country? Uh, the example given was Japanese knotweed, especially since some of these plants occur in several other Asian countries. Yes, absolutely. This is an identified problem by many people. Um, plants are intrinsically different um, from insects because they do not have an overarching naming authority. So in the case of insects, the Entomological Society actually holds an authority to change names. There is no such body in plants. I can only speak really to the insect world in saying that other names, such as names that start with things like Japanese, Chinese, Asian, German, Mormon, et cetera. So um, either geographic or um, other affiliated people type words, those are being discussed and those are being dealt with through the um, Better Common Names project that I linked to before. I cannot tell you specifically about Japanese knotweed because it is outside of my um, personal knowledge. I don't do invasive um, terrestrial weeds, but I would say that that's an excellent example of a plant that the name itself is not productive. It can contribute to Asian American hate, and um, that is a well that is a well acknowledged problem with geographic naming of things. And so it's an excellent example of a name that perhaps should be considered for change in the future. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, we have a few more questions in the chat, people are pretty interested. Um, so one person said, nice to see this change being made. How will the toolkit be disseminated? Uh, there's three elements that I know of personally for the dissemination of the toolkit. Number one is it will be present on the Entomological Society of America's website, as well as I would certainly hope um, it will be referred to on the Entomological Society of Canada's websites. Um, however, I can't verify that myself. Another thing is that I know that we will be giving a series of PowerPoint, uh, excuse me, um, webinars like this to make sure that major meetings talk about this change. And then third of all, there's going to be a distribution list of all sorts of professional societies and organizations for their newsletters to make sure that as many newsletters as possible um, talk about this change so people know about the existence of the toolkit to help them. Um, and then that also gets into Diane's question so I can be really efficient with my time, which is um, how long after the February 8th window will it be until the proposed names becomes an approved name? My understanding from what I've been told is it will be under two weeks if things go smoothly. However, it is not a guarantee that things will go smoothly if there um, is a significant amount of negative feedback. It is unfortunately possible we'd have to go back to the drawing board. However, my understanding is that things are going smoothly. So I would say within about two weeks after the February 8th feedback, you should take a look and see if it has been officially approved. Thank you. We have a question about the proposed name for AGM, which is the abbreviation for Asian Gypsy Moth. This is really a tricky question because there's actually two different things named that. One is the Lymantria dispar asiatica subspecies, which would be, in theory, Asian spongy moth. And then the other thing is a complex of multiple species that is referred to with the same name. 
The complex is an internationally held term and that has a different approach. And we'll be talking about that in the implementation kit. So I highly recommend if you want more information about that, you email me and I'd be happy to tell you what we're doing about the complex. Thank you. Thank you so much for that answer. And uh, it looks like we might have a few more questions in the chat, but we're going to move on to the next presentation. Um, if I could maybe ask you if you have a chance, um, I'll put them in the Q&A and you can answer the questions there if possible. Certainly. Thank you so Thanks. much for your time, everyone. Hey, thank you very much again, Lee, for your presentation. That was a great explanation. Um, next, I would like to present uh, Bree Walpole, who will be presenting Ontario's strategy to address the threat of invasive wild pigs. So Bree Walpole is the Senior Policy Advisor, Biodiversity and Invasive Species Section for the Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources, and Forestry. Bree has been involved in the ministry's response to the threat of invasive wild pigs since 2018 and led the development of Ontario's strategy to address the threat of invasive wild pigs. Bree continues to contribute to wild pig management in Ontario, including implementation of new regulatory approaches and collaboration with relevant agencies and partners. So welcome, Bree. Great, thanks so much for the introduction. Let me just share my uh, presentation here. There we go. So I'll assume that that looks good. So yeah, thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me uh, today to give the presentation. Uh, as Tara mentioned, I'll be speaking about uh, invasive wild pigs here in Ontario. And before I dive in, I just wanted to give a, a shout out and acknowledgement because the work that I'm presenting really uh, represents the combined efforts of a fantastic team. So it includes folks uh, from the section that I work with at the ministry, which is biodiversity and invasive species section in fish and wildlife and policy branch and also uh, a lot of work that was done by science and research branch with the min within the ministry and also colleagues at uh, OMAFRA. Great, so first of all, what is a wild pig? And it's funny, we were talking about names in the <laughs> previous conversation and it just made me think that, you know, wild pigs also have a number of different names. So depending where you are, you might think of invasive swine or feral hogs or invasive wild pigs. So again, they have a lot of different names. Here in Ontario, we do uh, call them wild pigs. A wild pig is any pig that's found outside of a fence. So any pig that's not contained or otherwise uh, under the physical control of a person is considered a wild pig. All pigs belong to the same species and they can all interbreed. And so they really have very different um, phenotypes and characteristics, but um, we do sort of bucket them into three different categories, which I'll go through right now. And so first of all, on the, the image on the left-hand side of your screen is wild pigs. These are from Aurora district and these pigs resemble um, escaped domestic pigs. And so you can see they have different coloration. They have that uh, corkscrew or, or curly tail. In the middle, we have a picture of a wild pig that is a potbelly pig. And this was this image is from Peterborough District. So you can see it's got that straight tail. It's got um, it's got the hairy coloration and a little bit of a shorter snout. And then on the far right, this is an image of a Eurasian wild boar, which was a wild pig in Midhurst District. That actually, our team uh, trapped and removed from the environment. You can see the Eurasian wild boar has a longer snout, it has these pointed ears, uh, it has bristly fur as well as that sort of longer tail. So as I mentioned, all pigs belong to the same species of scrofa and they can interbreed. And so really any pig that's found outside of a fence is considered a wild pig. How invasive are wild pigs? Well, they're incredibly invasive. So wild pigs are one of the most prolific um, invasive mammals on earth. Uh, they have this incredible reproductive output uh, they are very smart, they're adaptable, and they're highly mobile, so they can disperse quite easily. Um, once they become established in an, into an area, they can cause significant damage, uh, not just damage to the natural environment and native ecosystems, but also they can have really significant impacts on the agricultural industry. And this really ends up costing governments billions of dollars, not just for compensation programs, but also for control and management on the ground. Uh, when we think of wild pigs in North America, I think we often think of them 
in the United States. And that's true. You can see from this map, they're highly established and very abundant in the southern states. Uh, you can see the, uh, California, uh, Florida, uh, Texas, and so on. We do not think of them so much in Canada. But this is a question that uh, Ruth Ashram and Ryan Brook from the University of Saskatchewan really started to tackle. So they were the first people to look at wild pigs within the Canadian context. So these next three figures are, or these next three figures, sorry, are based on their research. You can see this first one here, those red dots on the map represent uh, watersheds where there was a, pres a presence of a wild pig. And that's from 1990 to the year 2000. So a decade later, you can see there's a lot more red showing up on the map. And then by 2017, you can see wild pigs are fairly well established, particularly within the prairie provinces. You can also see on this map that there's some images or some red in Ontario. So it's some of the first occurrences of wild pig in Ontario that we had heard about. Around the same time, so around 2017, 2018, we started to hear some anecdotal reports. Uh, they were reported to the ministry that people had seen pigs outside of a fence. So this really sparked the ministry's interest and we wanted to learn more about what does the wild pig problem look like here in Ontario? Uh, how many are there? What types of pigs are there and where are they? And so what we did is we launched a community science project um, to really create and populate a provincial sightings database to, to help answer some of these questions. And so there's a number of things that we had to do in order to launch this science. So first of all, we had to create uh, a, an easy way for people to report their sightings if they see wild pigs. So we developed the aptly named email address wildpigs at ontario.ca. And we were asking people to please report um, any sightings of wild pigs through this email address and include as much information as possible. So we were interested in learning about, you know, where were you when you saw the pig? Um, when was it? How many pigs? Can you tell what pig it was? Maybe were there young? Is there any damage? So we wanted as much information as possible. At the same time, we also developed a web page specifically for wild pigs within the Ontario context. So we wanted to ensure that we're providing some of the key messages to our audience, um, you know, messages about wild pigs so that people know that they are an invasive species, they can um, cause damage. And of course, we really wanted to plug uh, the public's participation in helping us to populate this database. And of course, what's really important for any uh, community science initiative is to ensure that people knew that we were looking for this information. And so we launched a communications campaign and we've actually been launching communications uh, over the last three plus years. And so we've done this through a few different means. We've launched uh, traditional media campaigns. So we developed mat articles that were picked up by local newspapers. Uh, it also prompted publications and magazines. Uh, we've been participating in radio interviews as well as uh, television and video interviews. And then finally, if you follow us on social media, if you follow the ministry, then you've probably seen some of our posts. We've put posts on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, and these have been all very successful. They've been shared thousands of times um, with hundreds of comments as well. And really one of the key messages that we've been trying to get out is that if you see a wild pig on the landscape, we do want, we do want to hear about it. And then finally, we're not the only people who are interested in invasive wild pigs in Ontario. So we've been working really closely with a number of key stakeholders and, um, and partners as well. And this has opened up opportunities for us to present uh, at different forums and also passing out a number of different fact sheets. Okay, so over the next uh, few slides, I'll be presenting information from my colleagues at Science and Research Branch. And this information is based on their most recent uh, sightings report. So they develop annual sightings reports, and this one captures sightings information from April 2020 until March 2021. And so what did we receive through sightings? We received all types of information. So lots of information on, of course, photos and sightings of pigs. We received pictures of potential wild pig damage, as well as trail camera footage. And so over the next series of slides, I'm going to be showing you some figures. And so these show the different types or the sightings that we received for different types of wild pigs. And this first one is the sightings we received of wild pigs that resemble domesticated farmed pigs. And so you can see there's a scattering of sightings, mostly in southern Ontario, southern and eastern Ontario, maybe. And um, one thing to know is when we looked and followed up on these sightings, oftentimes we found that wild pigs that are escaped uh, domestic farmed pigs, they tend to be recaptured by their owner or they tend to um, return home on their own accord. 
Now I'll mention on this figure, you can see around the sightings, some of them have a green circle and those circles represent sightings where the ministry took on the ground uh, steps to follow up on that sighting. And I'll get into that um, after I get through the figures. Okay, and so this next figure shows the sightings of uh, invasive wild pigs that were pot belly pigs. And you can see there's a number of different sightings we received. This is consistent with our previous report. And I will say when we first started collecting sightings information, we were pretty surprised to see the number of pot belly pigs that are on the landscape. Something else that's really interesting that ministry staff have discovered is that when these reports are um, submitted to the ministry, often uh, pot belly pigs tend to be mistakenly identified as Eurasian wild boar. So this is a good example in this image where you can see, if you imagine seeing this pig out in a distant field, it's a dark pig, it's hairy, it has a stray tail. And so this one, you know, could easily be reported to the ministry as a Eurasian wild boar instead of a pot belly pig. And again, I think pot belly pigs tend to um, be recaptured by their owner or sometimes they can also find their way home again. So I mentioned Eurasian wild boar. And here's another image. And so this shows sightings of wild pigs that were Eurasian wild boar. And there's not very many sightings on the map and that's a really good thing. Um, Eurasian wild boar or wild pigs, sorry, that are Eurasian wild boar tend to be particularly problematic we know based on research from the United States that um, this type of wild pig can become established quite easily. They have these ancestral um, traits that make them very able to adapt and survive and even thrive in the wild. And this research actually shows that um, the, the most abundant type of wild pig in the States is actually hybrids of Eurasian wild boar and domesticated pigs. And so these hybrids have not only those ancestral traits of the Eurasian wild boar, but they also have this incredible reproductive output of the domestic pigs. And that um, results in an incredibly successful invasive species. Okay, and then finally, it's no surprise that we received a number of sightings where we couldn't actually determine what type of pig it was. The sighting could have been of uh, pig damage or pig sign, or maybe it was a blurry photo and we just couldn't, excuse me, determine what type of pig it was. Okay, so before I move on from this sightings information, another really interesting finding is that the vast majority of sightings that we received were of single pigs. And this is a really good thing. Right now, the ministry doesn't have any um, data to, um, to indicate there are, that there are breeding and self-sustaining populations of wild pigs on the landscape. And that's great. We want to keep it that way. Also, I wanted to uh, put a, a little plug in here for my colleagues. There's recently um, a publication in Ecology and Evolution, and they looked at this data a little, bit, a little bit more and did some modeling. And they found that not only is there no evidence to support the idea that wild pigs are established and breeding in the province of Ontario, but there's also no data to support the idea that wild pigs are immigrating into Ontario from other jurisdictions. So really, we believe the source of wild pigs in the province is from containment, so escapes or releases from contained pigs. So I mentioned that in certain instances or circumstances, we do follow up on the ground to investigate certain sightings. And what we do um, in these instances is we chat with residents, we really try to find out as much as possible about that particular report. And so we can learn from residents if this is a reoccurring situation or if it's a new situation, maybe get a little bit more information about the number of pigs or, or where they've been or the time they were seen. We also set up baited trail cameras, maybe to get an image so we can get a better idea of the number of pigs that are in a group or the type of pigs. And then in high priority situations, we also take steps to actually track and remove um, wild pigs from the natural environment. Some folks may be familiar with a recent trapping event that the ministry led, and that was near um, in the GTA near Pickering, where 14 Eurasian wild boar were actually trapped and successfully removed from the natural environment. So all of this research has actually led to three peer-reviewed scientific manuscripts. Uh, also available on our website is two annual sightings reports, and so that, that includes the sightings report, sorry, the sightings information that I shared in this presentation as well as the previous sighting report. And the team has also developed a technical report. And that technical report includes a lot of the research and on the ground management that has been undertaken to date. And that technical report is available upon request. 
So we're often asked how many wild pigs are in Ontario? And the answer is, we don't know. And there's a few reasons that we can't answer this. One is because we don't always know the, the fate of a specific sighting. We don't know if that pig returned to captivity or maybe it died. We also know that because we're relying on community science in areas that are less populated, we're less likely to receive a wild pig sighting. And also we often receive duplicate sightings of the same pig and that can be difficult to tease apart. What's really interesting though, is that the number of reports or the number of wild pig sightings that we have received, they tend to be linked very closely to um, the presence of wild pigs in the media. So you can see in these figures, the top figure represents the number of wild pig sightings that were reported to the ministry over a given time frame, And you can see that that's closely linked to the um, media coverage for wild, wild sorry, the media coverage for invasive wild pigs over that same time frame, and so if you're looking for more information on this, it is available in biological invasions. Okay, and so we haven't only been taking action um, from a management and research perspective, but we've also been um, taking action from a policy and regulatory perspective. So most recently in the fall. We finalized Ontario's strategy to address the threat of invasive wild pigs. And in this strategy, the government committed to the goal of preventing the establishment of invasive wild pigs in the province. Um, and so that's really good. So that's taking a proactive approach um, to get ahead of the wild pig problem. And there's a few different objectives that we need to achieve in order to meet this goal. And there's actions that also need to be undertaken. And so these are all summarized in the strategy, which is available on our website. I'll just speak quickly to the, to the four objectives in the goal. And so the first one is common within you know, invasive species management. We need to turn off the tap, especially here in Ontario, where we know that the majority of pigs that end up on the landscape are escapes or releases from containment. So we need to prevent the introduction in the first place. The second objective has to do with addressing the threat of Eurasian wild boar. And I spoke about why um, that type of wild pig is particularly problematic. The third objective is to continue using that coordinated approach to remove pigs from the natural environment. So we recognize that there still may be pigs in, in the natural environment and we need to continue with this um, on the ground whole sound or removal trapping approach, which has been successful in other jurisdictions. And then finally, we know that the issue of wild pigs is cross-cutting. And so there's a lot of different expertise out there and we need to be able to leverage and collaborate with our partners and the other experts. So uh, as of January 1st, pigs are a restricted invasive species under the Invasive Species Act. And there are some new prohibitions that I'll run through that are associated with this uh, regulation. So first of all, this uh, first bullet really addresses that first objective in the strategy. Uh, it is illegal to release a pig into the natural environment. Um, and that said, we do recognize that there could be instances where there are accidental escapes. And so now through the regulation, there are obligations that owners have if their pig escapes. And those obligations include notifying the ministry and also taking action to um, to recapture or dispatch their escaped animal as soon as possible. One quick note on the notification that's particularly important because we do have our team of ministry staff who are out on the landscape who are following up and tracking sightings. And so it's really important that we're able to um, coordinate with the pig owner uh, in those instances. The second bullet there, live pigs cannot be brought into provincial parks or conservation reserves. We know these areas um, have high levels of ecological integrity and we need to keep them that way. Uh, hunting is now illegal in Ontario. And so this one is a little bit counterintuitive, but we can really learn or lean on that experiences and research from the United States that shows that areas that allow hunting of wild pigs actually experience um, greater levels of wild pig expansion. And so they're dispersing more rapidly and their numbers are also growing in abundance. So um, for these reasons, hunting is prohibited here in Ontario, although there are exceptions uh, in certain circumstances for protection of property. And then I'm finally, sorry, we've, yeah. Um, not to interrupt, just uh, we're running out of time in the session. Uh, we okay. have, um, just to let you know, but do you have a few slides left? Yeah, I think I just have, uh, one, one or two more after this, right? Okay. I'll move through quickly. Thanks, Tara. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. 
And yet finally, uh, through the regulation, we're um, implementing a phase out of Eurasian wild boar over the next two years. So by January 2024, it will be prohibited to possess a Eurasian wild boar in the province. So I did just want to give a really quick um, shout out about collaboration because it is, as I mentioned, a cross-cutting issue and it's really critical that we're collaborating not only on knowledge sharing, we're also coordinating our efforts and also leveraging these important partnerships that we've built. And finally, I'm not going to go through the slide completely, but I just wanted to mention that our partner ministry, OMAFRA, has also developed a fantastic fact sheet about how to um, deal with escaped livestock. And it's not scoped specifically to pigs, but it does have a really um, some really good information for wild pigs and of course all of our sightings information and we so appreciate that this ministry is, has been helping us with disseminating that information. And so I'll leave it there and just say if you do see a wild pig we want to hear about it so we have our email address up on this slide and I've also provided my email address uh, if there are any specific questions you'd like to be in touch. Thank you, Brie. Thanks so much for your great presentation on what's being done and all the great contact information that people can use if they spot a wild pig. Um, there's a few questions in the, the Q&A, um, but we're going to have to move on to the next speaker. Um, do you, can I ask you to maybe answer them in the Q&A? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you again, Bree. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce Sophie Monset, who will present Eyes on the Ground, working with volunteers to implement the Wild Pig Surveillance Program. So Sophie Monset is the coordinator of Ontario's Invading Species Awareness Program, a partnership between the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters and the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. For over a decade, she has been working to equip the public with the knowledge and skills needed to foster actions that aim to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species and conserve Ontario's resources for future generations. So thank you, Sophie. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I'm guessing um, everyone see my screen just fine. Yep, that looks great. Thanks so much. Well, thank you again for the introduction and thank you to the Invasive Species Centre for the invitation to present at this forum. Um, I think as we know, and as Brie has outlined in her presentation, wild pigs are certainly a threat to Ontario, to our landscapes, our recreational, logical, neck values. And so um, a really important topic discussion, right? Now. And I'd like to highlight how, you know, we also talk about how detection of a new species is vital to prevent establishment. And so when we think about wilds and we think about early detection, I'm here to talk uh, a bit about how we're, we're, we're trying to increase that capacity through the use of trail cameras and how using trail cameras and their use by engaged members of the public can really broaden that existing scope of surveillance efforts and capacity for early detection. And uh, we're able to do this by working with volunteer and providing them with the knowledge and tools needed. And I'm going to, to walk through um, our wild pig surveillance program and, and, um, and how we do right now in Ontario. I'm going to let this pop for a moment, but my slides don't want to advance. Did they advance for everybody? Please uh, stop me if they have on my end. So um, as, as mentioned, I'm the coordinator of Ontario's Invading Species Awareness Program, a long-standing partnership in the OFAH and NDMNRF. And our activities on an annual basis fall into a number of different themes or categories. So we do spend um, a fair amount of time creating education and awareness. And we focus on key pathways for introduction or spread. We are really trying to connect uh, different user groups, outdoor audiences, um, target audiences that are engaged in activities that invasive species can be spread. We also facilitate monitoring and early detection, largely through the delivery of provincial reporting tools, such as the Invading Spot Line. Um, we do receive reports uh, made for Ontario through EDMAPS or the Early 
distribution and distribution mapping system and uh, recognizing that a number of people use iNaturalist to report on uh, uh, varieties. We also have a project through um, iNaturalist uh, so that we can keep an eye on, on what uh, potential or suspect invasives be, be reported through them. We also support surveillance control and response initiatives. Some of the more recent projects that we're working on include uh, water soldier response and eradication. And for anyone who tuned in yesterday afternoon to Schreier's presentation, we have a mystery mitigation management project. Of course, what I'm here to talk to you about today, which is our wild pig surveillance program. So the Wild Pig Surveillance Program is an OFAH-led volunteer surveillance program. And uh, it's a program through which the volunteers are provided with trail cameras and other equipment to deploy and monitor for wild pigs in support of early detection objectives. And so I do want to acknowledge that this program has received funding support from the Green Shovels Collaborative. No, the, the collaborative has been mentioned numerous times throughout the forum, um, but for one unfamiliar with the, pro, the, the collaborative, it does include uh, of different conservation organizations, including FOCA, NCC, the Ontario Turtle Conservation Center, Ducks Unlimited Canada, Invasive Species Center, and Ontario Federation of and Hunters. The OFAH is interested in wild pigs for the same reason many other agencies and stakeholder groups are interested in this issue. Uh, we're concerned about the impacts or impacts they can have on our environment and uh, values that, that our environment does provide. We want the same out as many other agencies, and that is we want to prevent the establishment of pigs in Ontario. Bree outlined a lot of the great work that's being done provincially to respond to this issue. And we also want to be able to support those efforts um, in preventing the establishment of wild pig. And I think this is a bit of a natural fit for organization. Um, we, uh, many years of advocacy on this. Issue. We also deliver for 30 years now, a, um, a pro program focused on not only in awareness about invasive species, but try to engage people to take action. And, and that action include ensuring that they are reporting um, species that they've seen on the land, landscape. And we also, through our organization, have a strong connection to people who are in the landscape um, engaging in recreational activities. And a fairly solid volunteer program. And the planning really started with looking to and focusing on achieving success with the resources that already existed. And this could be uh, resources that were the result of our own advocacy, outreach, or policies, and also what others have done or similar projects that could be used. Hi, can everybody hear me? Tara, if you could just check in. Yeah, sorry, uh, we stopped hearing you for a second there uh, and we've lost your screen. Okay, I will share that again. Okay. I think right here. Um, if you need us, we can potentially switch over to uh, sharing our screen and do the slides for you if you think that would be better. But. Does it look like, is it working now for you? Uh, you're still in um, presentation mode. Okay. I'll escape. Redo. I must apologize, my internet is. Oh, looks good now. It looks okay? Yeah, it just needs uh, to be full screen, but it's good. Is that working now? Yeah, that looks great. Okay, 
thank you so much. And I do apologize to forum participants. It's life uh, working from home. So uh, Tara, chime in if, if you lose me again. Um, and, and so uh, to get back to where what I was uh, talking about, we, we did look to kind of what we had done to date and prepared to date for the issue, and also looked to what others have done, and then moved into brainstorming some of the potential logistical barriers that uh, could pre present themselves when implementing a program like this, such as sourcing gear, shipping costs, potential user errors. And it was through um, kind of this early brainstorming that we felt we were able to establish some goals and realistic expectations about not only how we could go about increasing awareness of um, case of wild pigs, uh, so increasing in participation in um, a volunteer program. And then finally, um, an important was also working consultation partners. And we certainly reached out to MNRF, uh, given the work that they're doing um, to respond to wild pigs, we wanted to ensure that whatever we did and whatever project we rolled out was complementary and in support of their efforts um, and not um, um, a duplication of efforts. By working with NDM and REF, we, they were able to help us um, identify not only some of the key messages that we could align and, and work together to increase awareness amongst participants, so helping with things like prioritizing um, surveillance areas. So after we have concept in place, set out to recruit and train volunteers and, and see kind of appetite it did for participants, and this uh, largely through a social media campaign. The social media campaign really focused on the issue uh, with a specific focus on impacts, reproduction, um, how people can report sightings. And we also placed an emphasis on why pigs require trained professionals and techniques to be captured and, um, and how the public has um, an important role in reporting potential sightings of pigs because those reports can really inform how um, the province as a whole, the collective we can move forward. And then finally, we had um, a call to action to take our registration survey and become a formal volunteer of the program. Um, we also included information and articles written for our OFAH Insider, which is our e-newsletter and affiliated e-blast that went out to our OFAH membership. And through this social media campaign, we were able to uh, achieve over 275,000 impressions. Um, and we did have a lot of engagement on, on the posts themselves. While we were rolling out communications, um, we did also begin to assemble the surveillance kits to be distributed to volunteers. So what you see here is the black tote with the um, yellow lid is, is what a, a volunteer participating in the program would receive. And inside of it is what you see on the left would be their pre-programmed non-cellular camera, memory cards, safety locks, lock box with padlock, um, locks to attach the tree, batteries, um, all of the equipment to help them um, help us with early detection. And then in addition to the equipment, they also would receive um, information and educational resources, such as the wild pig surveillance protocol and framework and um, labels that would um, inform anyone who stumbles across the cameras that they are uh, the property of um, OFAH and part of the program. And um, collectively, they would use all of this to um, deploy, deploy their cameras. And so I should say anyone interested in um, obtaining PDFs of any of these resources, please feel free to reach out to our program and we're happy to share them. This is just a, a quick visual of the, the two page framework that uh, can really provide that step by step instructions of um, how to set up uh, a trail camera for the purposes of this program. So as I mentioned, we worked with NDM and RF to um, identify our surveillance areas for the first year. And what you see here um, are the, the two areas where we did. So we did have an um, incredibly engaged uh, um, club attack affiliated with the OFAH in Lanark County that um, piloted the, the deployment of cameras and, and helped us um, kind of get, feel out how we can implement this project and this program on the ground. And then working with NDM and RF, we also highlighted near Perry Sound um, Wildlife Management Units 49 and 50 as our target surveillance areas for 2021. Um, the blue dots represent 
people um, or locations where we started to receive uh, registration surveys from volunteers and we received a total of 68 surveys. Um, these surveys were required um, to collect information on the participants themselves and also um, uh, forwarded or directed participants to the training webinar that was recorded by OFAH staff to ensure that um, they reviewed that webinar and had the knowledge necessary to participate in the program. And this is what our camera distribution and deployment looked like for the first monitoring season in 2021 on the ground. And so I think it was a successful year, uh, year one. So we did recruit 50 volunteers. We had over 7,500 camera days of surveillance and over 77,000 photos received. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our social media campaigns and, uh, were successful in achieving over 275,000 impressions and over 28 thousand engagements and one wild pig report was submitted. However, it was not a pig later identified as a um, suspected raccoon. And then I thought I would mention, uh, because I do think it's important that overall as a program, we did receive 34 wild pig reports. Um, and these were made as not through the wild pig surveillance program, but through the invading species awareness programs, provincial reporting tools. And so this slide does capture, um, you know, some of the photos that would be sent to us um, um, on a, a regular basis reporting invasive species, or in this case, wild pigs. And I think um, it's just important to recognize that these reports um, are being made by the public, and sometimes they do cross our, our desk, despite the fact that NDMNRF has um, reporting tools as well. And so we work closely with NDMNRF to ensure that if someone reports pigs to us, that we are asking the right questions, um, collecting the right information, and then connecting with NDMNRF to ensure that these reports do not go um, missed um, for to inform NDMNRF's um, approach moving forward. And of course, though, um, the surveillance season last year ran from March to, to June or July, but uh, a lot of work happens once the cameras are returned to, uh, to the office. And so I thought I would leave everyone uh, today with some of the photos that we received through the Wild Pig surve Surveillance Program. Uh, they're certainly not photos of pigs, but um, I look at them as uh, photos that can represent a a fraction of what we're all working so hard to, to conserve. Um, and, and really our work continues. So we are gearing up for the 2022 surveillance season. It will be focused in Northwestern Ontario. So in the very near future, we'll be pulling out, putting out our, our form call to action for uh, volunteers and uh, really looking forward to working with these volunteers again to help with early detection and, and really ultimately helping with uh, the preventing, preventing the establishment of wild pigs in Ontario. Um, so I think I'll leave it there, Tara. Um, I hope that uh, I got us back on time despite the technological difficulties experienced on my end. Yeah, thanks for... Yeah, that was a great presentation. And thank you for the, the great images at the end. Um, I'm not seeing any new questions in the chat. Everything appears to be answered. Um, I guess I, I had a quick question, uh, if you can answer it in one minute. Um, so for the, for the volunteers, uh, is there any like technical skills they should have? Or like, what are you looking for in a volunteer? No, I think, um, I think what's really great about this program is that it is meant to be incredibly user friendly. So, um, so by completing the survey and expressing your interest and commitment to the program uh, and participating in the webinar uh, training that we provide, I think that's really um, all you need as we do um, provide the equipment, it's ready to go. And then of course, there's ongoing support from our staff. Um, should anyone experience any difficulties, you know, they can certainly reach out and, and um, staff, but it's pretty, um, a pretty simple program to set up and, um, and then communicate back with us once the surveillance season is done. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your presentation and thank you for getting through it despite all the technical difficulties. I do apologize. Thank you so much. Yeah. And if there's any more questions, uh, 
they'll appear in the Q&A. Um, okay, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Okay, so thank you all for joining the presentations. Uh, we encourage taking action by getting involved in community science initiatives that the ISC or partner organizations have on the go. So you can visit the Invasive Species Center website for more details on um, opportunities like that. Uh, now I'd like to pass over to Mackenzie for the panel discussions. Awesome. Thanks, Tara. And thanks for those great presentations, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started on our first panel discussion on aquatic eDNA pilots and community science as it sets the st stage for a wider application. So I would like to introduce uh, our three panelists for this first panel discussion. Colin Casson from the Invasive Species Center, Chris Wilson from the Ontario Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry, and Terry Reese from the, or the Federation of Ontario Cottagers Association. So if you guys want to join me on camera, that would be lovely. Hi, Terry. Hi, Chris. Okay. All right. So if we want to go through and give a little introduction before we start, uh, Colin, do you want to start us off? Yeah, happy to lead off. Thanks, Mackenzie. Um, let's see here, trying to share my screen. There we go. Um, so five minutes or less, a quick introduction. Uh, I think what's out of scope today would be the, the mechanics of eDNA, but what we're trying to get across, I think, with our, our few minutes, if we can use them wisely, is, is just some of the excitement around the potential application of this tool. It's uh, a really exciting thing. So I'm going to try and not cover any of that backstory technical side of things and think more, put your headspace more in the application. And so I think, you know, we, we as well, uh, this is good kind of following off of Sophie there, because um, this is another Green Shovels collaborative project. And I, I think about 18 months ago, or maybe 24 months ago, we were kind of met with the challenge, which is a challenge I think we're all very familiar with. There's lots of invasive species out there across all taxa, across all habitat types. And, and um, you know, how can we be a little more successful in detecting them early is obviously kind of our, our MO. And you know, I think we're all very familiar with some of the challenges around that, that we live in a landscape that has a relatively low population density, lots of resources and places for some of these AI ester species, uh, invasive species more broadly to hide. And of course, when we're talking about aquatic systems, boy, aren't these things cryptic at times and, and really difficult to come across early. And we know from the invasion curve, the earlier we find them, the more the higher our probability of success will be. And so we've got an opportunity in front of us here, right? There's a, obviously a very engaged public. That's the recurring theme, I think, throughout the entire week is, is there's people out there willing to help and wanting to support and engage. Um, so how do we make best use of them? And also kind of this other train that's coming across the track at the same time is that we have a, a new or, or maybe more to the point, a more cost effective at this time tool and technology that's available for us uh, in eDNA sampling. And trying to put those two needs together is really our potential solution in the space that I think we're going to be speaking about in the next few minutes. And so what we're looking at here is an opportunity for scalable community community based sampling uh, using eDNA and, uh, and and this new technology. And we dream big. It's, you know, our first exploration in this space within the last year has been around um, aquatic systems because it's it's the most um, is the best opportunity, I think, for us for just to demonstrate proof of concept. But we dream big and we're not stopping at that. And so really we're just trying to understand, you know, how scalable is this tool? And we want to speak to that uh, in, in a couple minutes here. I do want to throw the big disclaimer on there that of course there's limitations. There, there's there's um, lots of fine print with respect to this technology and how it could be used. And I also just want to be clear as well that, you know, in no way am I implying that this is a, a replacement for traditional monitoring, but um, there's some really great application opportunities that I just wanted to walk through quickly. So I know time is tight, so I'll be quick here. Uh, I wanted to walk you through three quick hits, three steps here uh, that we've been engaging on the last 18 months or so. And step one is building the protocol. So uh, we're very much aware that eDNA technology has changed in the last uh, few years, especially, and that um, we now have the opportunity to utilize new technology that's a little bit more community science friendly. So what we wanted to do in our first step of this project is build the protocol and, and uh, do the science translation, I guess, um, into a very community science friendly version. So we spent some time building this protocol and happy to have you check it out at the website linked at the bottom there. 
But what you'll see on that is a, a PDF package that we've been giving to our community scientists as a bit of a methods trial approach. And we've tried to make it the, um, I guess the IKEA instruction equivalent maybe of science of eDNA sampling. So we've tried to be as user-friendly and direct as possible, try not to overcomplicate it, but still salvaging the important um, content that, that would enable a successful sampling effort. And this is just a few snapshots of what those instruction packages look like. Again, trying to make them as user-friendly as possible. The second step here before we can kind of operationalize this is supporting the users, just building those basic resources. So a very friendly two-sided fact sheet is a lovely resource that again, do a plug for our website there. And also a community science, uh, you know, how do you use that method paper that I, that I just described there? How do you use it in five minutes or less? So the same instructions, step-by-step, -step, the same process, but again, just that kind of video friendly version. Uh, that's published on YouTube and provided to all of our samplers. And so now those are the tools we've built. I wanna talk about how we've put them into action and what we've done with them. So I've got two case studies I wanted to speak to really quickly, just to let you know what the application opportunity has been for us in the last year. The first I wanted to highlight, it's a partnership that we've engaged with, with support, uh, funding support from Fisheries and Oceans Canada and the province of Saskatchewan to work with the Saskatchewan Association of Watersheds and a wonderful group of people out on the landscape, no formal background or training in eDNA, they were sampling uh, using more traditional methods for aquatic invasive species. And we, they were visiting 40 sites. We thought, you know, could you be our, our guinea pigs? And they were good enough to, to take eDNA samples using that protocol um, at 40 different sites. And so they, that happened last summer. We've processed the data and we're very pleased to report a few high level takeaways. One, what did we learn? The method works. We've got good data from them. Um, those samples that were processed using PCR, which uh, the effective, effectively what that's answering is yes or no for the species you're looking at, as opposed to other techniques, which would describe a community. Um, how, what other species are there? It would be a more open-ended style of question in, in a sense. Um, so metabarcoding, we also process some of those samples using metabarcoding. And we were really excited to see that as an opportunity to describe what was in that water body beyond just the zebra mussels, which was the pri primary objective of this project for other reasons. We also see so much opportunity here to link into describing a community. Are there species at risk present? You know, I'm coming, I think many of us are coming at it from the invasive species perspective. Uh, but also, of course, it's important to describe biodiversity implications for the site and so contribute and, and maybe link towards some of our partners that are working outside of the edges of invasive species, but still at fields that are, are um, intimately linked to what we do. And so some of the, the other takeaways we've been able to tease out of this data is just trying to compare when, when folks are, are on these sites doing traditional sampling methods and using eDNA technology, do we get the same result? Is it a cost-effective comparison? Is one method a little more cost-effective than another? Um, just trying to contrast against the results that we get out of both methods has been a really interesting bit for us. And we're happy to present that data at IK. So I'll do a quick plug for that event in April. The second uh, application of eDNA, I won't speak to it in detail because we've got Terry on the panel and he'll speak to it as well, uh, but just a second trial and, and really a similar program um, mock-up, I guess sampling a bunch of lakes with folks who are out there who, who don't have any past experience utilizing eDNA sampling, following that same protocol, watching the same five minute video, and just seeing if they can go out and collect good data using this technique. Now, I would like to note that same, uh, similar uh, sampling methods are being used there. So we have the traditional method and the eDNA technology being used at these sites. So again, come check us out at iCase and happy to speak to how do those results contrast against each other and what's the key story. Um, you know, we're happy to look to it. So how some of those cost comparisons, uh, you know, what is the cost of one sample using this eDNA technology uh, versus the more traditional sampling methods? Also, if we think about this from a program perspective, how much training and effort is, is required in training these folks or is just the fact sheet and a, and a quick five minute video um, sufficient? And so I, I haven't spoken to it in detail yet, but I do happen to have a kit in front of me. So I just wanted to give you the visual of, of what is this that we're talking about here? It's really not much more complex than a small envelope this size. We can ship out to our volunteers and participants. They can collect their samples. There's a few more small odds and ends of these kits, but effectively these are the two key functions here, a syringe and a filter. And pop that filter back to us by mail where we can coordinate these, send them to the lab and process the samples. It's really, that's the bare bones of this program. And what we've seen so far in two applications is that there's really something there. And it seems like an exciting opportunity to engage folks. 
So I did want to throw up a quick thank you on the slide there. I think my five minutes is probably up. Um, so I'll stop there and turn it back to you, Mackenzie. That's great, Colin. Thank you so much. I'm actually going to pass it over to Terry now. I think you had a few slides that you wanted to share as well to talk about um, your place in the project. Thanks. Uh, am I showing my, here we go. See that? Yeah, it looks great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mackenzie and the ISC for this great forum. It's been uh, a lot to take in, but it's been uh, great for, for us and, and for everyone. I appreciate that. And uh, for the support of the ISC staff that's been working with us on this project, uh, Colin, but also Rebecca and Darissa and, uh, and Lauren. So thanks so much and for the invite today. So just some background on who we are and why, why we're involved uh, we're an association of associations that uh, waterfront property owners from across the province. We've been around for about 60 years and represent about 535 associations of people um, who live and recreate on the water. Um, these waterfront property owners in Ontario collectively own about 15,000 kilometers of shorelands and 50,000 hectares of uh, private uh, shore property. So they've got a vested interest and uh, so they're a nice audience to tap into because they've often seen these properties over multiple generations and have a vested uh, interest in uh, in their protection. Uh, so one of our main um, citizen science initiatives over the years, this is the sites uh, monitored through the Ontario Lake Partner Program. It's the largest water quality monitoring, volunteer water quality monitoring program in Canada. It's been around for 25 plus years and that's a partnership with the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. So we've got a ready-made sort of uh, army of volunteers. These are people that are willing to go out every year to sample uh, their respective water bodies. Uh, the, we do that in collaboration with the ministry who um, analyze the samples and they're all, <clears throat> excuse me, available um, uh, through open data. Uh, for this particular program, as Colin mentioned, we worked with the ISC on iSample On, and that was again to try and tap into uh, this interest of our um, audience and people that were that were proximate to the challenge and the water bodies uh, that which we selected based on their chemistry and, and that we thought were uh, deemed to be at significant risk for particularly for zebra mussels. So uh, with the help of our folks at uh, ISC, we did selected 25 lakes uh, through uh, central Ontario and uh, provided them with uh, the tools they need. You know, working with citizen or community science is kind of a magic um, combination of providing, um, having the interested volunteers, which, which we're able to do, uh, having them adequately supported and also um, doing uh, methods that are going to be, give you good data that aren't gonna frustrate the members and that are gonna be, you can replicate uh, year after year. So this was an important opportunity to engage uh, these people um, and provide them with the tools they needed. Uh, Colin mentioned the protocol and uh, we did both the traditional um, the traditional uh, plankton hauls as well as the eDNA sampling. So we provided them with a bunch of tools, some videos, and a bunch of other information which was useful uh, to their efforts. And through that we were able to continue to engage them not just through our education and outreach but have them be a hands-on partner and and explore this new and emerging uh, eDNA opportunity which as Colin says we think holds a whole bunch of promise and um, we're anxious to continue to um, see how the, this pilot and others uh, yield some good information about uh, the future of uh, citizen science and detecting species of, of interest uh, to all of us and to our members. So again, appreciate the opportunity. We've got lots of information about these programs on our respective websites. I even gave Colin yet another plug for his site in case he didn't give enough. But uh, again, thanks, uh, thanks for the opportunity and it's uh, been, been a great uh, program. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Terry. So now we're going to get into the panel questions. I have one question prepared for each of you and then one for everyone. Um, so, Chris, maybe I'll start with you since you haven't had the opportunity to speak yet. Um, what do you think the future holds for eDNA monitoring? Is this type of work being conducted in other jurisdictions? Uh, it's, it's been piloted in quite a few jurisdictions. Uh, some jurisdictions are well ahead of us. There's a very good effort in Europe and there's uh, a national one started up in the United States. 
the the potential is close to unlimited. So we're not at the level of Star Trek tri uh, tricorders, but it's essentially the, the potential is really limited by what are the questions you want to ask. And I would say uh, Colin's slides gave a fantastic lead in, um, fully support everything he said. And the, the potential is that much more by having citizen science and stakeholder involvement. If it's government agencies and academic labs, sampling environmental DNA works, uh, including on some very surprising species, but these would still be localized small scale efforts. If, if we can have people in general involved and empower everybody, um, there, there's a couple of efforts starting up that are literally global in scope. So if, if you can think of the question, the odds are we'll be able to do it. And the technology is advancing so fast. It, I can tell you as somebody who does it, it's hard to keep up. That sounds like a very promising response, Chris. That's really great to hear. Um, so do you, you kind of answered this question already. Um, do you think there's potential for us in Ontario to expand this to a province-wide monitoring program? Uh, from some someone inside government, I am pushing for this now. Uh, the provincial auditor general recently criticized, and I still can't say the name of our ministry properly. Um, for basically, they would like if we're doing more in terms of biodiversity monitoring. We're doing better on invasive species than we are for other fronts. But this is something where environmental DNA can be really useful. So we have some, I'll say localized, efforts. So for instance, this is what's driving the uh, surveillance for Asian carp in the Great Lakes at the moment, but we're looking for them and not much else. And so that, that's one group within the uh, NDMNRF, um, within the province. There, there's other experiments going on, but we need to be doing more to understand what's out there. So not if invasive species are immediate concern because of the damage they can do. But if we took a community eDNA approach, we can also look for endangered species. The same samples can be used for looking at communities. What species are present? What's their relative abundance? Can we see trends through time? So I'm, I'm pushing fairly hard from within the government that we do need something provincial in scope that is also not just agency driven. So very much like the wild pigs example, have the government involved ISC involved, OFAH involved, interested public groups, both stakeholder groups like FOCA and private citizens. To basically say, if you have a concern, let, let's have a simple standardized sampling method so that anybody can collect samples, send them in, and your piece of the puzzle can contribute to the bigger picture. So Absolutely. I'm very hopeful for this and I'm personally pushing hard. That sounds really great, Chris. And looking at a community level too, over time, you'll likely be able to see impacts of invasive species as well, right? Yes. Awesome. And, okay, and great. One last thing, the advantage of the community <laughs> approach over the targeted one at a time species. If we go looking for a species, we may or may not find it, but we're literally blind to everything else. So, uh, Sorry, Brie or Sophie forgot which who was Sophie talked about Water Soldier. Um, my lab has been involved in that. I'm working with another lab at Trent University. We took the same samples that were used for looking at Water Soldier presence in the Lower Trent River, used them for examining for what's the aquatic plant community. We turned up a, no a number of invasive aquatic plants that people weren't aware were there. Wow where the eDNA really shines. Totally agree with Colin, this should not replace going out and physical sampling on the landscape because eDNA will not tell you everything. But it can say, this is somewhere you may want to go look. And if there's a particular species of concern, go there. And by the way, it works for wild boar too. That's great. Just another tool in the toolbox, right? It's good to have yes. something new and exciting. Exactly. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so now, Terry, I've got a question for you. Um, what are you hearing from the lake associations that are involved in this program? 
Well, like uh, there's many people that are after this kind of information and um, f for a whole bunch of purposes as public bodies, we want to be able to be able to manage our biodiversity biodiversity in an informed way, uh, you know, through our work with the Biodiversity Council and we do a state of Ontario's biodiversity report every few years. It, it's it's difficult to quantify a big land mass and lots of water and and quantify what's out there and what's what's changing. So any tool that's going to be helpful to give us a more robust uh, picture of of what's going on is important. Uh, certainly the volunteers that we've got out on the water, um, you know, they're interested, they're engaged. There's if you keep giving them stuff to do, <laughs> they can be a great um, uh, army of people who would be willing to uh, roll up their sleeves and do some work. Again, the eDNA uh, protocol has the benefit of being relatively simple, it doesn't involve a whole lot of bulk or materials or handling. Um, I'm sure there's other charms to it, like lab capacity and and, and other things. It's 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 right. There's I mean there's some limitations. I think Chris can maybe speak to that. But as far as um, the ease of use and the excitement of of volunteers to be involved, especially at the pilot or uh, leading edge of this kind of approach you know people are really excited to be involved in something like that they've got a personal and, and selfish stake that they want to make sure that they're understanding their local water body as, as best they can and and but they also there's a lot of altruistic uh, reasons for doing this and that's contributing to the broader understanding of what's happening across uh, uh, a watershed or across the province so it's it's got great promise and our members are really super engaged and and um it's it's more fool, foolproof, I think, and uh, that's always a good thing if you want to have good data. And uh, so, yeah, they're really excited, and uh, as are we. Awesome, thank you, Terry. That's great to hear. Um, Colin, what is the importance of this work, and what does it mean for community science? The big picture I, question. I think that's that's a million dollar question, right? I, I think, and I'm just kind of scanning. I think that aligns with some of the Q and A questions too nicely. I, um, I think Chris, Chris's uh, explanation to that point about the limitations being quite high um, um, is kind of the excitement factor for me. I, I think, you know, one of the things we were hoping to understand too with trying this, this method, not to say that there's many methods that could work with many different styles of equipment, just to Chris's point earlier, but what's the question you're trying to answer and is this the right tool for that or approach for that? Um, you know, one of the big things we were trying to understand is how much care and feeding, like from a program perspective, if we were to operationalize this, how much training and, and past experience is required? And, and that's obviously part of the cost benefit and, and speaks to viability of this program. And what we found was good data coming from, again, just very limited um, training, which is really exciting because that, that really shows us how high the ceiling could be on this. Um, so again, what we've done, what we've shown to date, I think, is we can get good quality data from community scientists with limited training before with a five minute video and a you know 10 minute document to read through. Um, and at that scale, we can scale this up to provincial scale or beyond. Um, so it's you know, that's that's kind of the exciting element is just we can take this pretty far. Um, and also, how far could we take this beyond AIS? I think that's another conversation for another panel, but um, there's no reason to say that we've we've demonstrated in this space. I think there's something here. Um, you know, maybe there's something for applying to other groups and other community scientists factions as well that could help us beyond just through the aquatic uh, system. Absolutely, great. Nice to hear some hopeful news out of the invasive species world. Uh, so now I'm going to move towards the Q&A um, from the audience. So if anybody has any questions that they haven't dropped into the Q&A box, I welcome you to do that now as I start going through the couple that are already there. So how big of a challenge, and if there's not a, a specified person this is to, I'll let you guys decide who wants to answer. Um, how big of a challenge is stratifying methods for sampling and analysis or standardizing, sorry, I saw the edit, standardizing methods for sampling and analysis of eDNA? I jump in on that one. So I, I, I typed a bit of an answer in there, but for standardizing, um, there's an ongoing effort and it's actually global 
in saying sort of what information do we need and how reliable is the tool? It's kind of like if you're worried about a mole on your arm, is it just a mole or do you want to go see somebody about it? So what's, what's the skill set of somebody observing it? But what information do you need to collect? And then what needs to be reported with it? So there, there are global efforts going on in Canada. Fisheries Notions has developed several white papers on what they consider necessary. Uh, last year, I was part of a national group for the Canadian Standards Association saying what information needs to be included, uh, basically what rigor for both data collection and reporting and interpretation. So we now have a national standard. And there's a lot of interest from the US and other countries in the Canadian effort as well. So we're moving forward. There, we're not trying to get to there is one and only one proper test for a given species. But there needs to be reporting on how reliable is the tool you're trying to use? What's its sensitivity? What's its repeatability if another lab does it? So it's evolving rapidly. Um, I would say we're really starting to reach the plateau now. So somebody could look at this document and say, yes, I trust these results or no, this was done in Uncle Bob's garage. Hey, that's great. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so amazing projects. Excited to see how a similar model could be applied in New Brunswick. Were eDNA samples collected once per season and does timing matter? I think that's one of you guys. Yeah, I can, I can jump in. So on the two projects we did, um, low replication per site, collecting one sample, um, we could expand that. I think the initial vision was to do a summer and fall. I, again, I, you know, it probably depends on Chris's point about what do you, what's your question. I think our initial vision for it was if we can process these samples for four species, plant, a couple of plants, a couple of fish, maybe a mollusk in there too. Um, are, is it the same sample that's being processed? Is it collected from the same site? Is it being done at the same time of year to address how much eDNA is available? Um, I think that just depends on your study design and what are you trying to probe at? We, I think we were trying to answer the question, could a community scientist collect a good sample um, for species that we probably know are there? So, so that's what we, I think, we're trying to do early on. Um, so I think we did that, but I think you're, to your point there, next iteration, Shelby, is... is how many more species could we add? Is there multiple times of year, multiple taxonomic groups? Maybe we tell people to go to a boat launch, collect a sample there to, you know, to a deeper site uh, part of the lake and collect a different sample there that's answering a different question. Um, so yeah, just one sample per site is the short answer. Okay, great. Thanks, Colin. Um, Chris, interested in your thoughts on how ready Ontario's lab capacity is to do the analysis for community eDNA sampling. Um, we're already doing it. There's basically there's multiple groups doing this. So within government, I would say it's limited because it's my lab. I would like to see uh, MECP step into this because their water quality testing sets them up for success in this already. There's also private companies uh, doing this. So Precision Biomonitoring in Guelph uh, is one, one group. Um, they do excellent work. And one, actually, I'm not trying to hype the company, but um, an important thing is for anybody wanting to ask a question with this, one of the first things would be, what's the question? And you want to get advice on sampling design. There's limits in what you can get from one syringe sample from a water body. So uh, precision biomonitoring, there's a company called eDNA Tech with links to Guelph. It's, their lab is in Newfoundland. But um, a lot of consulting companies are very interested in gearing up for this as well. So there is growing capacity. Right, right now for getting off the ground, I would say it's my lab, precision biomonitoring, and eDNA tech, and quite a few universities that are getting started up on this as well. Hey, great. Glad to hear that it's growing in capacity. That's good news. Um, is there any technology being developed where rapid tests can be used by NGOs or citizens to do the analysis themselves? I don't have the answer, but I wanted to thank Francine for asking about where our tricorder is. And I'll leave that to Chris to answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I dated myself with that illusion. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll just stay away from tricorders right now, other than their science fiction. Um, 
there's quite a bit of technology already available to make it possible for just private individuals to do it. It's not cheap. Uh, one that uh, Precision Biomonitoring has checked out, it, it's called a biomeme detector. It's about the size of a smartphone. This is, by the way, a phone, not one of these detectors. Um, but basically, take a water sample, extract DNA from it, add it to this thing, and about 90 minutes later, it says, well, for the species you're interested in, did we detect it or not? Uh, my lab is working on a very low-tech approach. Um, the, the acronym for it is LAMP. The full name is Loop Mediated Isothermal DNA Amplification, which is why we have an acronym. But basically, instead of having to send a sample to a lab, take your water sample, get the DNA out of it, and then what you essentially need is a coffee warmer and a smartphone and a little kit. So basically, instead of needing the fancy equipment in a lab, you can make copies from trace amounts of starting DNA and then be able to detect it literally using your phone and a coffee warmer. So this is being in development. It's not just my lab doing this. Uh, in the US, they've developed these for uh, grass carp and black carp. My lab, we've been using brook trout as our guinea pig because it's a lot easier to find a brook trout than an invasive species. But uh, that technology exists now. It's just a matter of developing the tests for particular species of interest. There, there's even next generation sequencers about the size of a smartphone that will do the community eDNA. They're not cheap and you need to deal with all the information that comes out of it. But it, it's the technology is here. It's just a matter of adapting it for the particular species we're interested in. And one last comment on that, very much like the COVID masks that have been developed, you can put them on and while you're wearing it, it'll test to see, are you breathing out COVID particles? That technology exists now it wouldn't be difficult to adapt it for individual species. Very cool, thanks, Chris. We had a, a presenter, I believe yesterday morning, talking about oak wilt and they're working on a rapid test for that. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and I, just my own comment, I remember about five years ago, I was at the University of Guelph for an ecotoxicology conference, and that was my first experience with eDNA. And they had a little thing where you put your cell phone in into this little thing, and then you popped your sample in the top, and then it took maybe an hour or so and told you right on your phone in the app. And that was five years ago, so I'm sure the technology is advanced since then. That's exactly the device I was talking about. Cool. And, and they have advanced from there. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So in interest of time, I'm just going to move into our last question. If there's any more questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A and our panelists can answer in there. Um, my final question for you all is, um, do you have any advice for groups who would be interested in conducting similar work or implementing their own eDNA program? I think we've probably touched on a few things through our discussion already, but if you have anything to add, this is the time. I'm going to let you guys go first. <laughs> I, I, I think our experience to date has been um, there's something here. Just keep going. Just keep trying and, and adapt it as we go. And um, I, I think from my perspective, in terms of people using this for invasive species within our, our ecosystem of Ontario and Canada, um, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of people here. But if we can share some of our lessons learned, boy, that would be wonderful. Um, there's a, a postdoc at Cornell who's, who's trying to uh, answer that question about how do you turn eDNA into community science appropriate? What's the model? And um, so it, just the feedback from, from her research so far has been, there's people out there trying to noodle on these questions and, and it's just a matter of them finding each other. So hopefully this is a first step towards finding each other and, and swapping experiences. Awesome, thanks Colin. And I, I might just add that uh... If you have a question, maybe it's something where there's an eDNA can be part of the can be part of telling the story. So keep asking the questions, and there's lots of interested groups around, and ISC's done a lot of leadership in this area. And uh, yeah, just keep asking those questions. Um, one last thing I would add to that is for anyone wanting to pursue this, reach out. So the, you're limited to the samples you take, and it does matter where you sample, when you sample, in aquatic systems, what depth, how intensively you sample, 
So if you want to say, is a species present, you need a different sampling effort than if you want to say, is it not present? You don't get zeros, you get non-detections. So to say, we're confident that it's not here, you need a much more intensive sampling design and say, well, based on this level of effort, we have this level of confidence, it's not here. Again, it's very much like medical diagnostics. So reach out. And I would say the, the ISC is a great starting point. OFAH is a great starting point. If the question comes to NDMNRF, I'm getting old sucks. Um, the, the question will end, end on my desk, but we'll try to get it back. So it's anybody, if you've got a question, is eDNA a useful tool to add for trying to tackle that question? Reach out. Let's say, what's, this, what's the question based on that? What kind of sampling effort or design do you want? And then based on that, it can try to maximize a chance of success. Hey, awesome. That sounds like great advice. Thank you all so much. We're going to wrap up our panel discussion now and move into our, our next one, continuing this fruitful discussion on community science. So thank you all so much for your great comments and for dealing with me asking all the tough questions. Thanks, Mackenzie. Thanks, Chris. Colin. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thanks, everyone. All right, so now I'm going to introduce our panelists for our second panel discussion to close off the day and the forum. Um, so this panel discussion will be on how community science has been moving the bar on terrestrial invasive species nationally and at a local level in Eastern Ontario. So I'd like to introduce our panelists, Jerissa Vincentini from the Invasive Species Centre, Aaron Lewis Appleton from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, John Pino from the Eastern Ontario Model Forest and the Ontario Woodlot Association, and Belinda Junkin from the Ontario Invasive Plant Council. So welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to pass it over to, oh, welcome Belinda, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm going to pass it to Jarissa to give a little bit of an introduction on our community science work and the community science that's going on in Ontario and beyond. Awesome, thank you so much, Mackenzie, and welcome everyone. Uh, I am the Community Action Leader with the Invasive Species Centre. Um, are you seeing my screen okay? Yeah? Okay. Great. Awesome. You are in my... There we go. All right. So, um, I just want to give like a brief overview, kind of similar to the previous discussion there, um, of the projects that have been going on in the past year before we get into the guided discussion with some of the key partners um, that made this work possible. Um, firstly, I just wanted to touch, and we've heard some common themes throughout the entire conference, and especially today, about the importance of community science and the power. Um, but the biggest one it, that I want to just touch on is kind of increasing the eyes on the ground, contributing to important research and monitoring. Uh, the more eyes on the ground refers to pretty much anyone, trained professionals, to hobbyists, and even to children who want to get involved. Um, it's not only the sheer number of people on the ground that help us detect a new introduction earlier, but it's also the locals and the community members um, that end up actually, they're more likely to notice the subtle changes in their backyards and in their neighborhoods because they're more familiar with it. So I'll jump into some of the programs. One program that we coordinate at the ISC is the Early Detection and Rapid Response Network of Ontario. And we deliver this in partnership with the Ontario Invasive Plant Council and the Eastern Ontario Model Forest and Ontario Woodlot Association. Uh, it's a community action network aimed to train uh, training community members on how to detect, report, and respond to invasive species in Ontario. And we do this by providing the tools, training, and resources necessary to help slow the spread and introduction of invasive species through education and outreach. Currently, we're wrapping up our third Ontario Trillium Foundation grant to carry out this project, so a big thanks to the OTF Foundation uh, for their ongoing support. This past year, the Ontario Invasive Plant Council created two new technical bulletins, which are great resources for anyone looking to manage invasive plants or on their property or on their property or host management events. They're a great place to start, um, especially with the best management practices. We were able to also provide resources, materials, expertise, and tools uh, to other organizations to engage their networks and take on their own community science initiatives. So we're not always just putting them on ourselves, but also just providing those expertise 
So we've provided like printouts and of the fact sheets or technical bulletins for distribution to their networks or supplied things like extract gators for communities to tackle buckthorn infestations. As you can imagine, many of our training workshops uh, this past year or two years even um, have been virtual. Uh, and with our partners, we've hosted several amazing workshops and webinars and classroom presentations. Although many of us see the value in in-person events, these virtual events were certainly far reaching and with an engaging audience. Um, some had more than a thousand live attendees, which is amazing. And uh, they followed it up with a very engaging discussion that lasted for hours. <laughs> Um, so I think it's safe to say that it still had a great big impact. We also provided some self-guiding initiatives uh, so individuals can take part in a larger project. So um, we hosted the second annual LDD egg mass scraping contest. And uh, through individual efforts, we are happy to say that we actually had over 10,000 egg masses scraped collectively. Another way we encourage community members to take action is through our community science tree check form. Um, created in partnership with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And this form allows community members to assess and report the health of their backyard and neighborhood trees um, and look for signs and symptoms of the presence of invasive pests without having any background knowledge of forestry or invasive species. Uh, we even teamed up with Scouts Canada to help pilot the project where they implemented the form into their summer programming. Um, and it was really, really great to see all of the reports come in from scouters across Canada. In the form, we outline 10 common signs and symptoms that may indicate the presence of an invasive pest and all of these pests or all of these symptoms um, can be visually assessed. So without any measurement tools, field guides or poking or prodding, which is great. It allows for community members to truly play an important role in making early detections in high risk areas like municipalities and on private lands um, to prevent further spread of invasive species into our natural forests. I'm happy to announce that we had over 300 trees reported in the past year after only launching the program in May. And uh, we plan to continue it again this year. So check out our website to get involved. We were able to get on the ground when restrictions allowed to do some woodlot tours, information booths, and some public outreach and engagement, which was really great to just, you know, be out in the fresh air and actually see what we're working towards and engage with those people on the ground, which was awesome. Through all of our events and with our resources, at the very least, we hope to leave everyone with enough information to report sightings of invasive species. Um, I, feel, I feel like this is one of the easiest and most effective ways to just to be a community scientist is just report it. And there's many means, you can call hotlines, you can download apps, you can use the web, um, all sorts of ways to report it and just tell someone who's in, an expert in the field. So in summary, despite the restrictions and challenges over the past year, uh, we were still successful in moving that yardstick forward. Um, in the past year, we held 30 or so events, workshops, training and self-guiding initiatives for community members to take part in, uh, through which we engaged over 3000 people who now have an awareness of invasive species within their communities. And of those over a thousand volunteers are trained to actively manage, manage and monitor for invasive species within those communities. If you'd like to find out more about any of the community science initiatives that I've talked about or that we will talk about during the discussion, um, please just visit the Invasive Species Center's website. And there you can also sign up for the, our newsletter where you, if you're interested in being notified about events and opportunities to get involved. And lastly, I wanna thank our core partners for all of the work, time, effort, and expertise you contributed to make this year successful, as well as the many organizations that collaborated with us along the way. And thank you to all the community members for getting involved and making a difference. And with that, I'll pass it on to our core members to introduce themselves. Awesome. John, you're at the top of my screen. Do you want to go first with an introduction? Sorry, was that me, uh, Mackenzie? Yes. Sorry okay. if I muted myself um, prematurely. No, no, my hearing isn't the best. So that's good. Yeah. Hi, everyone. John Pino, I'm the executive director of the Ontario Woodlot Association and the Eastern Ontario Model Forest and a very happy partner in the EDRR um, uh, project and uh, just helped our membership to be informed and, and better prepared for invasive species and, and how to manage them, how to prepare for them. So uh, yeah, just happy to be here. Really enjoyed this session that what I've been able to take in. 
Great, thanks, John. Valenda, would you like to introduce yourself next? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for uh, hosting this event, ISC, and uh, for this uh, workshop this afternoon. OIPC has been involved in early detection rapid response since uh, we started it with uh, ISC, partnered with them, and um, it has been a great program engaging citizens throughout the province in different regions, and seeing that program mature and grow um, has been really rewarding. Um, you see the results um, and you see the, um, I think to what Jarissa was saying, you feel it when you're in that group of people, the energy. And um, I think that's what it's all about, informing people and inspiring them to, to, to make change. That's a really great point. And I think a great start to this discussion too, Belinda, thank you. And last but not least, Erin, would you like to do a little introduction? Kenzie, I'm Erin Appleton. I'm currently the National Manager for the Canadian Food Inspection Agency's Plant Health Surveillance Unit. I am incredibly passionate about community science and thankful for organizations like the Invasive Species Centre who have so effectively helped us implement a number of successful projects in this realm. So thanks for having me. Awesome, thank you. We're happy to have all of you here. So now I'm going to move into our question period and as we go, as I mentioned in the last panel, feel free to drop any of your questions for the panelists into the Q&A box that we'll get to um, after we get through these main questions. So Erin, my first question is for you, um, and this is specifically about the tree track form program and the partnerships that we've had there. Um, a community science program that's backed by a federal agency is really powerful. Can you speak to how the Tree Check Forum and other similar initiatives aid in the obje objectives of CFIA's programming? Sure, that's a great question. So under the authority of the Plant Protection Act, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency aims to protect plant life and agriculture and forestry sectors of the Canadian economy by preventing the importation, exportation, and spread of pests and by controlling or eradicating them in Canada. So knowing that pest intervention strategies are most effective when focused on prevention and early detection, we need to really optimize our collective efforts. Canada is a huge country covered with um, over 40% uh, land acreage covered by forests. So we really need to be creative in finding ways to obtain data on the status of our urban and natural forests so we're better equipped to detect invasive species introductions early. So this is really one of the greatest benefits of the tree check form as it enables us to gather comprehensive forest health data. Furthermore, it allows us to establish collective pest priorities that can be promoted through public engagement and strategic outreach. So by working with the Invasive Species Center on the community tree check campaign, we're able to engage citizens well beyond our established networks of our current pest priorities while enhancing our in-house survey capacity. Community science aids in early detection and rapid response, but it also supports risk intelligence for the CFI by highlighting areas at risk, looking at emerging threats, and also helping us to identify knowledge or information gaps. So by engaging citizens through platforms like the Tree Check Form, it helps us to foster a greater understanding of invasive species threats, supporting prevention, early detection, promoting compliance, and also rapid response to protect Canada's plant resource base. Thanks. That's great. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, Darissa, how do you engage people to get involved in community science? And are there particular groups that you try to target? Yeah, great question. Um, I think that naturally we end up working with groups that already have a good relationship with the outdoors or the natural environment. So, you know, your gardeners, your horticultural societies, anglers, lake associations, woodlot associations, um, things like that. Because like I said, they just always already have a close relationship with being outdoors in those natural spaces. And I think that they're also like the first line of defense almost um, in a way because they're already outside. Often they're in tune with their environments. Um, so they're, likely to notice those changes on the landscape. And uh, I think that that's naturally where we fit. But that being said, we really do work with a wide range of backgrounds, ages and expertise and interests, um, not just people who are already active outdoors. Um, anyone can get involved. Um, 
And I think it's important to note that not everyone gets involved for the same reason too. I think many of us on the call probably just feel like it's almost our duty to protect the environment and our natural spaces and things like that. But someone else might have different priorities and um, different reasons for getting involved. And that's important to realize and you know maybe change up the language and talk about the points that are of interest to who you're trying to engage. Um, and I think invasive species impacts everyone, even if they don't know it yet. So just that language is really important. Um, and in terms of kind of how we engage everyone, I think it's really, really important to uh, decrease barriers and um, eliminate as many barriers as you can. So make it simple, concise, um, easy for anyone to kind of pick it up and run um, as best as you can um, for different backgrounds and expertise, but also make it fun if you can. You know, it's always nice to get out with a group of people with like-mindedness and um, make an event out of it, have some food maybe. I know maybe after the pandemic <laughs> more, but uh, things like that. Um, I think Ken Donnelly's talk early afternoon today really made me think of other ways to get people involved and engaged. Um, so I'm gonna try and implement some of those strategies moving forward. <laughs> That's great. I'm sure Ken's on, I think he said he was going to sit out on this discussions this afternoon. So I'm sure he'll be happy to hear that. <laughs> uh, my next question is for Valinda. Um, are there any particular species that you get a lot of questions about? And what's some advice that you may give to those looking to get involved in community science? Well, that's a really interesting question, Mackenzie, because it really changes by season. And I find it's, it's kind of what's topical or what might people be experiencing or see when they go outside their door. So um, as soon as that snow starts to melt, the uh, inboxes will be inundated with questions on garlic mustard. How do I identify it? What do I do with it? Can I eat it? How do I pull it? Where can I get it? Um, all of those kinds of questions. And then as summer moves on, I think we move into more um, giant hogweed. Last year was a big topic and it was uh, talked about, um, uh, promoted through even the weather network. So once something goes live on one of the other media streams and lots of questions on giant hogweed and its safety and um, lookalikes, people sending us lots of pictures. And then we move into, as we go into fall, I, I find it to be more dog strangling vine as it's become established. People are more aware of it and seeing the seed pods and Japanese knotweed as everyone looks at these giant masses. So um, it's really by season. And then you have the, the decoration period where things like the fall where everybody wants to put a nice pot on their front step and they want to talk, we're talking Phragmites, don't move it, um, spread and oriental bittersweet and things like that. So. I really find it changes by season and, and kind of what the, um, what the use is or what the cause is to make someone ask. Absolutely, that makes sense to me. Um, and yeah, if there was any advice that you might give to people that wanna get involved in community science, I know you've been involved in it for a long time. Um, I think uh, number one is to join a group, um, find, a, find a common interest. Um, that could even be a local conservation area or just a, a neighborhood or a neighbor um, that wants to get together with you. But I think um, you start with education and awareness, understanding what's out there and some knowledge. And then um, I think the next part is really about learning how to report. Um, as Darissa was saying, things like EdMaps or iNaturalist really help, help create that bigger picture of what's going on. Um, I think education, again, is so important, especially when we talk about safety, because you don't want to take on any of these plants without fully understanding them and understanding the risk to you, your pet. Um, things like giant hogweed can really hurt uh, people. Um, and then I think the other thing with garlic mustard is permission to remove. People just want to, I see a field, I want to help, I'm going to go remove the garlic mustard. And you're not allowed to do that in cities. Even if it's in a park, you need permission. So um, make sure that you have permission to do what you want to do. You have the proper tools, you have a plan and a disposal plan. 
because again, what are you going to do with all the items that you remove? And um, and then it's about building capacity, hosting events and, and encouraging people to come by. But I think it's more than a one-time event. So you need to think long-term, are you in it for today or are you in it for multi-years? So, um, and it is a multi-year task. It's like a pet. You can't just take it home when it's cute. You have to keep coming back every year and checking your plot. So those would be my, that would be my advice to someone who wants to get involved is find some support, join a group, and then start the education process. Wonderful. That's great advice, Belinda. And John, my last question is for you. Um, what are you seeing as the biggest concerns for woodlot owners and how valuable is this community science work for woodlot and land managers across the province? Oh, thanks, Mackenzie. Yeah, Belinda stated a while it, you know, sometimes you feel that it's it's the immediate, you know, what they're seeing when they step outside their doors and and they take a hike in their woodlots and they see something happening and and uh, you know you get that freak out sort of situation and and that's the uh, the, the flavor of the day. But in general, uh, from our membership, what I hear the most about is what can they do to make their woodlot healthier if they do have a, a, an infestation or an invasive species problem or what they can do to prevent that. And through the, uh, through the project EDRR and, uh, and working with the Forest Health Network and the Invasive Species Center, we've been able to, to you know, educate, uh, tech transfer, whatever you wanna call it, knowledge share, all of that good information that they've really appreciated and, and helped not just you know, through Zooms or, you know, sometimes in-person events if we can swing one, but also uh, through the recordings that are available afterwards. And, and they, they say they're just invaluable to them. But what I hear the most about in terms of, of you know, the invasive species, um, you know, definitely uh, emerald ash borer and, and their black ash are all dying, um, buckthorn, dog strangling vine. And um, of course, this, this past... Uh, Past year, it was the LDD moth, big time. And uh, we, we really addressed that and had uh, a lot of folks tuning in to, to just find out what they can do. But what was nice, there was a two-way flow of information. You know, you have a specialist or an expert giving you all kinds of, of good science and, and practical advice. And at the same time, people could kind of say, well, I've tried this or, or done that, and it worked or it kind of worked. And they get advice and you get that dialogue going. <clears throat> and, and that really help them to, to address those issues. But um, I think one, one thing I wanted to talk about too is um, the, the cost. And if they, they have an invasive problem and there's a cost, they're concerned. You know, they, they, they really want, again, that healthy forest to be reestablished or, or protected from invasives. Um, so what we, we've started to pilot is these community forest owners cooperatives that, that basically allow a, a, an economy of scale we have woodlot owners in, in the vicinity of each other and they can group together and we coordinate it and they can bring in specialists and experts, contractors that can say do a, a spray for dog strangling vine and it's much more economical if you're doing three, four, five properties at once in the immediate vicinity. And it also eradicates, you know, the dog strangling vine controls it at a much better level, more pervasively. So that's the kind of thing we're, we're trying to see and they're really liking that. So they're concerned about those things. I think, you know, we just did a, an issue of our quarterly magazine, the Ontario Woodlander, which focused on climate change and managing our woodlots for climate change. And they see the invasive problem being exacerbated by, by climate change big time. In fact, it was a, an LDD moth on the front cover of the magazine, uh, close up. And it's, it's amazingly cute, but destructive. Um, so, you know, kind of what we can do now to make things healthier, keep things healthy, and how do we, how do we address the, the future with a, a, a climate change that's going to exacerbate more invasives or the, the current invasives that we have? Those are the big issues. That's great, John. Thank you. I uh, made a note of the Community Forest Owners Cooperative because I think that sounds like a really great program. Um, and I'm glad you brought up dog strangling vine and some of those understory plants too, because I think when most people think about forest pests, they think about the insects, right? But yeah. the plants can really cause issues too, when, especially for woodlot owners, when you're trying to get in there and do work and get things done and you have these big invasive plants getting in your way and 
causing yeah, well, safety hazards. Do dog strangling vine, for instance, if you, if you go to thin a conifer plantation, which is a good thing to do, it's, it's a healthy thing. You want to maintain the health and keep the plantation healthy when you plant a lot of trees 30, 40 years ago. If there's a lot of dog strangling vine in the understory, uh, basically you can't get the natural regeneration of indigenous hardwood species coming back. You have to get rid of the dog strangling vine first. So it's, it's a, it's a, you know, kind of a, a, a tough, tr a, 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 a troublesome thing to get it back on the right successional path to get, you know, to get that natural regeneration coming if there's an invasive like dog strangling vine covering the floor. Absolutely. Thanks, John. I'm just going to pop in the Q&A and see if we have any questions, which I don't think we do. So maybe you guys covered everything pretty well. Um, but I do have one last question for the group. So maybe we can have a little discussion surrounding that and we might be able to wrap up the day a little early. Um, so from your point of view, which each of you has a very different point of view, I think, um, what do you think is the greatest benefit that community science can provide in preventing the establishment and spread of invasive species in Canada? Anybody wanna go first? I can jump in first if you'd like, sure. kind of a more generalized opinion, I think. Um, but I think just the sheer power in numbers, um, like I'm sure we've all heard the saying, like more hands make less work. <laughs> and I think that that holds truth no matter where you are on the inv invasion curve. If you're looking at prevention before species arrival, you know, the more that people implement the strategies to prevent the spread and the, limit the pathways of spread, um, then the less work we have to do in the end. And if you're at a management point of view or eradication point of view, you know, the more people you get out on the landscape actually managing for these species, then the less they're going to spread further and things like that. So I think, and even with monitoring, um, you know, I could be walking down one street, but if you're walking down the other street and that's where Japanese knotweed is and you happen to walk by it, if you already know what you're looking for, just keep an awareness while you're outside, um, then you'll be able to report it. Whereas I didn't take that route and I didn't see it. So I think really the number one thing is just the sheer power in numbers and how we can help each other that way, whether it's directly or indirectly. Thanks, Teresa, that's a really great point. I can chime in next if you like, Mackenzie. Uh, I just, you know, kind of kind of supplementing what Teresa said, uh, you know, an informed forest landowner is a better steward and, and they hunger for that good information and understanding. And, Again, that, that extension knowledge exchange, the flow of information both ways um, just, just makes it very powerful. And we're far more likely to, to have some victories um, locally, regionally, maybe provincially, nationally, if we can get everyone um, informed that way and, and following you know, good forest management practices, um, dealing proactively and, uh, you know, regularly and, and with with the conviction to, to manage invasive species or, or head them off so it's a great point thank you John Aaron I saw you had flipped your mic off for a minute there so you can go ahead if you'd like yes I was just thinking you know COVID kind of has a silver lining and that's citizen science because I think that Community science is driven by people having a deeper meaning associated with their surroundings and the environment. And, you know, 15 years ago, Emerald Ash Borer was kind of similar, where it was this awakening where everyone is surrounded by dying ash trees and they had to take note and, and recognize forest health issues where we didn't always have this connection. So by building that awareness, I think we're establishing a deeper meaning for people and, and a greater connection to drive them to make a difference. You know, they, they start to take note and then determine, hey, I can have an impact here. So you have to have those feedback loops in to make sure people stay engaged and maintain that community science element. I think it gives us that comprehensive baseline data and the knowledge of our current plant health issues Overall, though, we know it works because it helps us, you know, have a pulse at both subtle and macro scales, like Darissa indicated. But we've had, you know, major detections in Canada as a result of citizen science. Both Asian longhorn beetle detections were citizens reporting beetles on their car, and those resulted in eradications, eradicating 
heating a pest from Canada, which is a tremendously significant impact. Furthermore, we had our first North American detections of European cherry fruit fly and box tree moss via citizen. So it works, it's effective, and it's happening with or without us. So we might as well be in the game for sure. Absolutely. Thank you, Erin. Belinda, do you have anything to add? I, I think I'd just support what everyone else has said a little bit further by saying, again, it's that education, it's that increased awareness that helps enable um, early detection, early action, which reduces the, the spread. So I think that whole idea of um, community science is about enabling and collaborating. So it's, um, again, just, I think everyone's already said it, it's that ability to share the information and learn from each other, but it's that early detection that's a key. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. And if I could add one thing, I think my favorite part about community science is that it's really a great avenue for, like, as everyone has said, knowledge transfer. But, you know, we're often seen as experts. We're the ones reading the scientific literature and we're like translators from that scientific literature to the public, um, which I think is really important because a lot of the times, you know, some people don't have um the knowledge to understand or interpret jargon that's in scientific papers and that kind of literature um, so it's a really really important tool from that sense as well as far as i'm concerned and we did have a question pop into the q a so before we wrap up i'm going to read that um, are there existing tools available to guide organizations in creating a successful volunteer event or volunteer stewardship group or perhaps a list that combines the several case studies presented in webinars or forums like this over time. Thanks for a great forum. Uh, I'll chime in a little bit. Um, as for tools, I think it depends on what exactly you're looking to uh, implement in terms of a volunteer event. Um, there's plenty of general tools out there for community science, regardless of the topic. And then um, more specifically, like we, we have a uh, pamphlet on how to host a garlic mustard pull, um, especially like Belinda was mentioning, like knowing that you need to do pull permits or get permission for public spaces and things like that and how to engage with volunteers and contact groups. Um, but I think another thing is just getting involved with other groups that might already be doing stewardship volunteer uh, initiatives as well. Like there's um, we heard from OFAH doing the the mystery sale um, volunteer initiatives and so many different initiatives going on, Fragmites, everything. So there's definitely work already being out done out there to get involved with and not reinvent the wheel. But if it, you're looking at something novel, then get in touch with some of the, the experts in the field like OFAH, OIPC, us, um, contact us and we can just have a discussion about it and talk about those lessons learned with implementing volunteer um, events and things like that and help get you started. I don't know if anybody else has other um, uh, tools and things available that they wanna add. Oh, John, I think you're on mute. There yeah, you go. Thanks. Uh, I just encourage the power of partnerships and uh, and getting together with like-minded organizations, and that that is what really makes I think uh, any endeavor like that successful. And uh, but Teresa hit it right on the head. Uh, there's there's such, such good array of resources out there, and and, and folks that can uh, can work together and help. Those partnerships really make the difference. These these sorts of things. For sure. Thanks. I don't want to step on your toes, Belinda, but I know OIPC has some really great technical documents that are available as well. Right, there's that the technical information that's available on our website, the Ontario Invasive Plants.ca, as well as the ISC website, EDRR website. Um, and as well, there's some, some great community action happening in some of the municipalities. Um, it makes me think of um, the city of London just prior to COVID had created an adopt, adopt a patch program for garlic mustard in the spring, whereby they would uh, provide tools and the webinars on how that was done and what the outcome is, is all available on our website. So there is some municipal action, I want to say, or coordination happening or within conservation authorities. So again, 
I'd say it's about reaching out, finding those groups that that might already exist and have the tools for you. But there is a lot of resources between all of our organizations um, that supports um, whatever your interest is and um, and how to go about setting up any of these programs. Awesome. Thanks, I think, Melinda. I think I would just add on in terms of the webinars and forums, uh, all of ISC's webinars are available on our YouTube page. And I know that other organizations do the same thing. I think OWA has a YouTube page and Belinda does OIPC. Yeah, yeah. Every, I think a lot of organizations do that. So that might be a good place to start looking, typing in some keywords and finding pa even past webinars and um, that have already been made. That's a great point, Teresa. Thanks. Erin, do you have anything to add for that one before we close off? No, John really nailed the most important point from my perspective, and that really is the power of partnerships, working with the people who know how to engage communities, know how to execute educational content that is tailored to a wide range of audiences, and kind of divide and conquer that way. So to me, it's working with the right people who know how to do this effectively. Thank you, guys. Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you so much to all of our panelists today. Um, I think that was really a fruitful discussion for both panel discussions and I'm really happy that I was able to facilitate today. So another big thanks, round of applause to all of you. Um, and I'm now going to pass it on to the ISC's Executive Director, Sarah Rang, and she's going to give some closing remarks for the forum as we finish off the day today. Uh, thanks very much, Mackenzie, and thanks to all of you uh, who've been on our panels. Um, I want to thank each and every one of you to uh, being part of the Invasive Species Forum 2022, hosted by the Invasive Species Center. Uh, my name is Sarah Rang. I'm the Executive Director of the Invasive Species Center. Just wanted to uh, take a few moments to close us off. Uh, I wanted to thank the Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry for their ongoing support of the Invasive Species Center and, and making events like uh, this forum possible. We are pleased to welcome Minister Rickford, Pacini and Romano from Ontario and thank them for their ongoing support. We had a record attendance at the forum with over 600 people participating over the three days. We've traveled the country, uh, we've talked about forest uh, plant and aquatic invasives, and I uh, just wanted to highlight a couple of the themes that we've heard. Um, and a big thank you to uh, Liz webcam Gad from Batchewana First Nations, who started us off um, teaching about the dish with one spoon, uh, learning lessons and treaty. And she focused us quite rightly and quite uh, from the beginning in terms of uh, sharing resources. Take what you need, leave some for others, and most importantly, give some back. It was a wonderful uh, collective call and a great opening for the forum. Many of us have talked about uh, the awareness of the inv impacts of invasive species growing, the combination of climate and human dimensions and invasive species making our lands and waters more vulnerable. Um, we've heard uh, through uh, about organisms and trade being a priority vector and unexpected threats and how to deal with emergency situations like moss balls. We've talked through the importance of prevention as a key strategy for invasive species management, the traditional focus on pathways and vectors, uh, collaboration um, being all important in, in our fight on invasive species. We've also heard some new in, uh, interest in terms of quantifying the costs of the impacts of invasive species uh, from some of the global experts who are building a new uh, cost uh, database for invasive species and some new work reaching out with municipalities. Uh, many of us have uh, thought about how can we help promote the resistance and resilience of ecosystems? How can we bend the curve on biodiversity loss so that we can bounce back quickly after an evasion and especially uh, under a changed climate. Um, what I found personally wonderful about the forum is the sense of optimism uh, in terms of hearing how native plants can actually rebound after invasive species um, have been controlled after years of effort, uh, led by some of the folks talking about Phragmites uh, programs on on Lake Erie and through our community science and our eDNA uh, panels just today. Um, we took Steve Hounsel's recommendations to heart when he asked us to look in the mirror as we do our work 
And he stressed that a healthy ecosystem sustains healthy people and a healthy economy. Uh, great points to share with others who are trying to understand what we mean when we say uh, the words biodiversity. Um, this awareness that is growing on invasive species and the importance uh, in terms of biodiversity loss is helping integrate invasive species into many of the works of land management programs. Thanks to many of you, we're really making progress in terms of integrating invasive species knowledge in Indigenous communities, private woodlots, forestry parks, municipal programs, backyards, and cottage lake programs. We're encouraged by the work in terms of developing new tools uh, on invasive species management, both technical tools that we've heard about during the forums, such as drones and DNA fingerprinting, management tools such as structured decision-making and modeling scenarios, and also communication tools um, work uh, in terms of understanding human behavior as we seek to communicate about social media, uh, about invasive species. I uh, also wanted to recognize the important progress made in Ontario in terms of listing new species and watercraft under the Invasive Species Act uh, that we heard about through the forum. Uh, globally, uh, there's some interesting work going on as well in terms of the development of the International Convention of Biodiversity and its links to invasive species and as this work rolls out. We are also delighted to, to present the first Invasive Species Awards and congratulate all the nominees and the award winners. Um, we're always looking for new partners and projects at the Invasive Species Centre, so please don't hesitate to reach out to any one of us uh, that you've seen over the past three days um, for any information there. Um, just looking ahead briefly, the, um, the applications for the Invasive Species Microgrants are due on February 4th. It's a very short application. Uh, please uh, consider applying. Uh, we can all join together shortly again in uh, February 28th, March 4th, which is Invasive Species Awareness Week. Um, there's many opportunities for all of us to use our voices uh, to draw attention to invasive species. If you need any materials, uh, please take a look at uh, the Invasive Species Centre's uh, website and you can customize those for your own use. Uh, in April, we're delighted to be hosting uh, the International Conference of Aquatic uh, Species, uh, co-hosting with Belgium and Netherlands. Um, so you can join from your living room or, or join in person, and that will give you a very good overview of invasive species management in Europe and also in North America. Just wanted to close the forum with a big shout out uh, to thank you to all the 50 speakers who've joined with us over the days and uh, shared all our information and knowledge uh, with the group. A big thank you also to our hardworking uh, Invasive Species Centre team uh, who helped put this event together, who've been uh, chairing and moderating uh, over the days. And uh, a real thank you to you for, for sharing your time and participating uh, in the Invasive Species Forum. I hope that uh, it's provided you with an opportunity to uh, learn uh, some new thoughts, uh, per perhaps meet a, a virtual partner or two, and most importantly, to provide us uh, with the inspiration that we all need to continue your important work in uh, the fight against invasive species. Um, if you missed any sessions, don't worry, uh, they will be put up on the ISC uh, YouTube channel uh, in the next couple of days so you can access those as well. So just wanted to thank you um, for your continuing work in terms of invasive species management. Don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions. And I uh, just wanted to formally close the 2022 Invasive Species Forum. Many thanks to all of you.